Good morning. morning. Wait for our picture to show up here. Um, As it does, about, um, I don't know what it was, a few months ago, I got an email from Reverend Karen, and she said, uh, I can't remember whether she said it was one person or more than one, came in and talked to her one day about all the, what, these are her words, the labeling that's going on in our society, our culture. And in the light of the election and all of that sort of thing, she said, this person came in and said, why do we humans spend so much time labeling people? And Karen said, would you do a class about that? I said, no. (laughs) That was my initial response because I didn't really know what to do about it. But I started thinking about it, and the word label, of course, brings up the image of stereotype. And, you know, if you've listened to me at all or gone to classes that I teach, I spend a lot of time looking at what's called archetypal psychology, archetypal spirituality. And something came to mind and said, what, the question was, what is the difference between a stereotype and an archetype? Uh, What what do they have in common, just in the words? Types. Types. They're both types. Um, the Greek word typos or typos, tupos, which are typewriter, remember those antique typewriters? Um, they make an impression. The, the steel strikes the ribbon, and the ribbon has the ink, and it impresses on the paper, and it imprints an image on the paper. So that's a type. A type is an impression, an imprint. So a stereotype is an imprint that is identical to the thing that makes the mark. Does that make sense? When you go to a copy machine, you basically make a stereotype because it's identical to the very thing that you just copied. But an archetype, on the other hand, comes from an original print, but the copy that's made has its own unique distinguishing marks. It's not a stereotype. There's something that's similar to the pattern, the original pattern, and yet it's distinct. I want to tell a story this morning to look at the difference between stereotypes and archetypes and to touch on this idea of how to turn a stereotype into an archetype. Um, In the class, we're going to be able to do it in in, in much more depth of discussion. In fact, this this talk is, as I'm sitting here this morning, there's a part of me going, run. (laughs) Because this is, is my image there? This is potentially a troubling topic. Um, I was talking to someone the other day about spirituality, and I told this person, I said, you know, the older I get, the more I realize that my spiritual theories are often light years away from my spiritual practice. You understand what I'm saying? I can come to church or I can go to a class and I can talk about all this metaphysical mumbo-jumbo and theological and spiritual practice and yada, 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 and then go out the door and become a completely different person than the one that was in there talking about all these theories and, and spouting all of these cliches and information. Do you understand? So that's why I'm scared of this, one of the reasons. So here's the story. The story is about Jacob in the Old Testament. It's a very famous story across the ages, and most of you have heard of it in one form or another. But the the very short version is this. Jacob is in a family that is a typical sort of family, stereotypal or archetypal, whatever. And in this family, he has some problems with his brother. Have you heard the story? And for those of you who haven't, the, the short version is this. Jacob is a deceiver. He's a manipulator. He wants to get his way. So he's constantly tricking his brother to get stuff from him. Sound familiar? Any of your sibling experiences in the past? So he tricks his brother to the point that he offends him mightily. And his brother's name is Esau. And he steals his birthright, basically his inheritance. No small thing. And as a result, what would you imagine Esau's response was? Was he happy about it? Hell no. He was so angry that this animosity was in the the, the home that Jacob left and he went several hundred miles away to start over. He was terrified of his brother. He went, he got married, had children, amassed a fortune. He was away from home for 20 some years. 
Finally, he decides to go home. Now, I'm trying to imagine, it doesn't tell this part in the Bible, but I'm trying to imagine how Jacob talked about his brother over those 20 years. Because this is what we do, right? When we grow up, we leave the house, we go out, we start dating, we meet people, and they always ask us about our families. And in fact, some have said this is the dating ritual or the courting ritual in our culture is to date people over a glass of wine or Starbucks and tell them our dysfunctional family stories. <laughs> so I'm imagining Jacob off in his new home and somebody says, so tell me about your family. And I can imagine what he says about his brother. Oh, I have a brother and he is Evil. Hitler. And they say, why? And then he rehearses the litany of problems that makes this stereotyped one imprint image of this character called his brother just evil. He's the embodiment of evil. That's a stereotype. Now, as the story goes along, it's very interesting because after 20-some years, Jacob decides to go home and he takes his fortune, which is herds of goats and donkeys and cattle and these herds and, and his family, and he's on his way back home. And on his way home, some of his scouts come back and say, we've been out looking over the territory and we met, but no, your brother, and he's coming to meet you. And, does anybody know who his brother's with? He's got 400 men with him. So how do you think this makes Jacob feel? Holy crap, this guy's not only evil, he's super evil. So the story goes on and talks about Jacob trying to figure out what he's going to do about this evil brother that's coming. And he sorts out his herds and he sends some gifts to his brother and he puts his family off in a safe place. And he, it says he goes to a little part beside the river and he spends the night alone. Now there's nothing like the nighttime when you're alone to let the stuff go on in your consciousness that terrifies you, Yes? There's something about the nighttime that has this special archetypal flavor to it that isolates us in our pathologizing, our neuroses, our terrors. Yes? So he's lying there and it talks about, it says an angel of the Lord, a messenger of Yahweh in Hebrew literally, comes to Jacob and it says, what does he do with him all night? Do you remember any of those of you? He wrestles with him. This is the image that artists have been painting. This is his brother, when he finally meets his brother. But this is the image here. He wrestles with the angel of the Lord. Now, in the ancient world, you have to understand that people didn't talk about dreams. When people had vivid dreams, those kinds of dreams you wake up from and you're not sure for a few seconds whether it was real or not, you know what I'm talking about, those dreams? People said those were dreams that were messengers from a god. That the gods had visited them in the dream. That's why it was so real. So this wrestling with the angel of the Lord is called um, Jacob's night dream, and it doesn't tell us what he wrestled about. It gives us no, I think that's brilliant. One of the reasons the Bible is so brilliant is because it leaves these huge gaps for you to fill in for yourself. My suspicion is that in that dream, he was probably wrestling with meeting his brother the next day with uh, 400 men. A little scary. So it says that the night goes by and he wrestles with this angel of the Lord all night long. To me, it was a long nightmare. And at the end of the dream, we read that Jacob says to this angel, or the angel actually says to Jacob, the angel says, let me go. I, they've got each other in a headlock. I was going to actually do a little illustration up here and try to bring somebody up, but I didn't think you probably wanted to do that. So he had him in a headlock, and they got each other in this headlock, and the angel says, you know, let's go. I'm, we're done. This, is, this dream's over. But Jacob says, no, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. In other words, I want a resolution to this problem. I don't want to just have this dream over and over and over and over and over and for those of us stuck in stereotypes, you know what we do? We have this dream over and over and over and over because this person is 
evil, or whatever we've stereotyped them. They may be deity, maybe the opposite. It's like, this person is my God. So Jacob wants a resolution because he's sick of this, this neurotic worry. Any of you ever have neurotic worry? Never. So we read in the story that the angel blesses him, and it doesn't really give us any details about what that blessing is, but he gets what he's looking for. Now, to me, the interesting part is this. When he wakes up from the dream, it's one of those dreams where you, oh, my God, oh, my God. He says, I have just seen the face of God and man and live to tell about it. Let me say this again. I have just seen the face of God and man or humanity and lived to tell about it. And it says in the story, Jacob named the place Peniel. Pene in Hebrew is face. El is God. Elohim. The, play, the face of God. You know, we, we read that. and For, for years I read that. And went, well, that's kind of cool, whatever it means. But then in the very next chapter... It says that Jacob dressed, his family got ready, they got the flocks, the herds, they took off in the direction toward home, and they meet Esau with the 400 men. And as you read the story, it says that Jacob and Esau approached each other after 25 years or so. It's a little different people. And Jacob had this stereotype in mind of his brother as this evil enemy that he had been terrified of for 25 years. And it says that his brother Esau embraced him. And they wept. That's this artist's rendition here, where the two brothers reunite. Now, the words of Jacob are the most important to this story. We read in the Hebrew Bible that Jacob says to his brothers in the midst of this embrace and the tears falling down their cheeks, he said, seeing your face, brother Esau, is like seeing the face of God. This is amazing. Because suddenly Jacob's stereotype has been shattered. For 20-some years, he saw this individual as only one monolithic, unidimensional being. He had no clue that this being that he had so vilified for 25 years was actually a multi-dimensional, multi-archetypal, multi-faceted character with more than one face. Did his brother have an evil face? I mean, in the big picture? Absolutely. But he suddenly saw that he had another face. He had the face of God. Now, it says in the story that Jacob's name was changed. This is so important. His name was changed from Jacob, who, does anybody know? Israel. To Israel. Israel. Again, you've got the L, which is God. Israi, and there's debate about this, but most agree, is the Hebrew word for struggle. So Jacob went from being, the word Jacob means deceiver, went from being an egocentric, stereotyping deceiver, because when we're in stereotypes, you know what we do? We manipulate reality. We manipulate reality to conform to our stereotypes. No matter what is given to us, we have to manipulate it, turn it, twist it, to make it fit the stereotype. But Jacob suddenly wakes up to the fact that this stereotype is an archetype or archetypal, and it's no longer this unidimensional being. It's a multifaceted being made in the image of God. This is how Genesis starts out. Humans are made in the image of God, and the whole book of Genesis, in fact, the whole Bible, is a story about how humans are made into the image of the many faces of God. So Jacob's name changes to one who struggles with God because suddenly Jacob's focus was no longer on his egocentric stereotyping manipulation. His whole consciousness had shifted to where now his focus was on there is some divine circle that encompasses this whole reality and from this divine face comes many facets, many faces, many archetypal patterns are in front of me in this complex world like the colors on an artist's palette so that these colors are everywhere, these faces are everywhere, and every single one of them is the face of God. Now, it's easy to sing about the face of God when it's somebody you like. Yes? But when it's somebody that we have categorized 
And one of the reasons I was nervous about this is because I have worked with conservative churches for years ago. For 15 years, I worked with conservative churches. And now over the last 20-some years, I've worked with more liberal, quote-unquote, liberal New Thought churches. And I've been telling people recently, when they say, are you a liberal or a conservative? I say, yes. <laughs> and they say, well, when you go to a conservative church and speak, which I haven't much, but when you go to a conservative church, do you offend people when you speak? And I say, yeah, sometimes, other times, no. Well, and they said, when you go to a more liberal-minded church, do you offend people? Said, yeah, sometimes and sometimes not. I said, I don't really feel like I have a stereotype community. Do you understand? I said, but I still slightly prefer the more liberal churches because there seems to be a little more room to allow for the archetypal perspective. Little more room. And I speak as a family member. Yes. As a family member, what I have found after 20-some years in the New Thought Movement is that we are all human beings, conservatives and liberals. We have a continuum on both of those political slash religious lines. We have people on both of those lines, liberal and conservative, who are extreme stereotypers. And we have people who are open to the archetypal perspective. So what I'm sharing, what I want to share with you this morning from the life of Jacob, and it comes in movies, is that there is more than one face to everyone we stereotype. This is from Star Wars. You remember that movie? Darth Vader, the dark father, who is Luke's number one enemy, is pure evil until later in the story... He too, like Jacob, has an awakening where he finally seals, sees that this enemy that is his father is actually a human being. And he actually turns out to be a pretty good guy. Yes? So this is not unique to Jacob. This is a storyline that shows up all through good writing. In fact, Christopher Vogler in his wonderful book, The Writer's Journey, says this. He says, the archetype is a flexible character. Rather than a rigid uh, character stereotype, this approach can liberate your storytelling. I would say liberate your life. It explains how a character in a story can manifest the qualities of more than one archetype. When we move from being Jacob egoic manipulators with our stereotypes to Israel, the divine archetypal face of God perspective, we go from being people who just see life through a little tiny keyhole. Do you understand? To people who can see a character that we don't particularly care for. This doesn't mean you're going to start running around and loving everybody, even though we say that all the time. What it means is you're, you're going to not intellectually, this is not an intellectual experience, this is a heart experience. You're going to move to the place to where you can see that person you've been vilifying and say to yourself or see, ideally, this person is more than this label. You know, ever since we've got the computer technology and the internet especially, I remember in 2000 when Bush was elected, going on the internet and Googling Bush Hitler. Do you think any images came up? Holy crap! There were images of Bush with the little mustache. And then when Obama got elected, I just out of curiosity Googled after a few months, Obama Hitler. <laughs> you know what I found? A little mustache. Lots of them. And then this current president, what's his name? <laughs> when I Googled Trump Hitler. Whoosh, Trump Hitler. All over the place. Is that a stereotype? I'll let you answer that. Now, very quickly, the difference between stereotypes and archetypes, and as I said, this is just enough to get me in trouble, but I'm introducing this. An egoic stereotype, a person or idea in an ego stereotype perspective is an either-or. Do you understand? You're either black or white, Republican or, or Democrat, liberal or conservative, bigot or non-bigot, pro-immigration or anti-immigration, you're either in 
or you're out. And if I'm on this side and you're on this side, you are out and you are evil. That's stereotype. Archetype, on the other hand, a person or idea is complex and nuanced. There is progressive liberalism and conservative liberalism. How many of you have heard those two terms before? If you know the history of this country at all, you know that there are progressive conservatives and liberal conservatives. Or rather, there are um, conservative liberals and progressive liberals. In the class, we'll talk a little bit about the difference. My opponent is always deeper than my vilifying stereotype. When you look at stereotype, labels are created by the personal or partisan ego to see either the face of good or the face of e evil. We've already talked about that. Labels are avoided on the archetype side in order to see the many archetypal faces of God in every person and idea. Stereotype side, life is about defeating my or our unidimensional labeled opposition. This is like Jacob. When you label somebody evil, you have one goal in mind, and that is destroy them. Period. I don't care if you're on the left or the right. We don't see this on the media, do we? I don't care. You pick a side in the media, and it's pretty stereotypical. Yes? No? You decide. Archetypal, life is about the gods utilizing, or God or gods, utilizing every archetypal pattern and face in order to make the individual and the world soul. Do you see the difference here? From the stereotypical perspective, life is basically lived just on this level. And if you are in my or our way, the aim is to manipulate you. From an archetypal perspective, how does this change? It goes like this first, right? You're on a divine level, and then you're on this level. It doesn't mean you stop living on this level. It doesn't even mean you stop your social activism. I'm not one of these spiritual fluffies standing up here saying, you just go out and love everybody. Go out and do your, your, your political activism, but the difference between doing political activism from a stereotyped perspective is very different than doing it from an archetypal perspective. How? From this perspective, basically, I live in a state of chronic anxiety. Because if I'm not getting done what I think needs to be done right now, oh, this perspective, I'm doing the very same things I'm doing over here, except I am continually tethered to the face of God. Do you understand? So what's going on, ultimately, when I put my head on the pillow at night, it's not how can I manipulate, it's what's being done in my soul right now through this opposition. Something bigger is going on than just this level. Do you understand? Skip that. I want to end with this. How do we turn a painful stereotype into an archetype? I'm going to read from the Gospel of Mark. Jesus has these wonderful words. It says, One of the teachers of the Jewish religio-political system came and heard Jesus debating the religious and political leaders of his day. Jesus never debated religion. This is something that's a total fallacy in our modern culture. Jesus always debated, in fact, in every culture, when you debated religion, you were also debating politics. They didn't separate them. America is the only place that has ever tried to separate religion from politics. We'll talk about that more in class. So J Jesus is debating religion and politics with the leaders of his day. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all God's laws, which is the most important? Jesus answered, the most important law from God is this. Say it with me. Read it with me. Please, together. Love. Amen. That's the first commandment. Now, I've underlined especially understanding because when we're in this stereotype perspective, there's no understanding. Do you, do you understand? <laughs> there's really not. When you can put the love of God first with your heart, 
your mind or understanding, your soul and all the strength of your being, when you do that, you have made a shift from this anxiety-ridden, neurotic, pathologizing, the world's coming to an end, hair on fire, stereotyping. It does not mean you start agreeing with this perspective of the opposite. But what it does mean is that when you are disagreeing, you are saying the whole time, my goal is to love the Lord my God with all my understanding, which means I want to understand my enemy before I kill him. <laughs> Goes on and says this. The second is this, and this, is a, this sequence is what I want to close with. The second is, is this. After you love the Lord your God with all your understanding and your heart and your soul and your strength, that is when you see the circle of influence, of archetypal influence encompassing everyone, then you love your neighbor as yourself. The implication is, love your neighbor, love yourself, but you don't do it fully until you love God first. Let's just do a quick closing prayer. Oh, Holy Spirit, infinite one, personal God, it's my prayer for myself primarily, but for anybody that wants to piggyback on this prayer that you would fill my heart with such grace and such love and such understanding and my soul with such clarity that I am capable of looking at those people and those ideas that I hate and to see somehow how your face is imprinted on them before I try to destroy them. Amen. <laughs> Blessings. <laughs>